Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the keynote session of this afternoon. I hope uh, you have uh, found the, uh, the morning session to be fruitful um, and you're ready for the next uh, session coming. So uh, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Mr. Shei uh, Bushan with us. Uh, Mr. Shei is the senior associate of Saha Hadid Architects, where he co-founded and heads the research activities for the Computation and Design Group, or CODE. He also works as a studio master at the AADRL Master's Program in London. He pursues his research in structure and fabrication aware architectural geometry as a PhD candidate at the uh, Block Research Group at Etihan Zurich. Previously, he has worked at Populous uh, London and completed his MPhil from the University of Bath and MR from the AA School of Architecture London. Uh, Shei Jie has published in scientific journals and conferences, along with contributions to architectural discourse uh, through architectural design and other magazines. Uh, he's taught and presented work at various professional co conferences, events, and institutions across the world, including the AA at London, Etihan Zurich, Polytechnic of Milan, and Bari, Tongji University, Shanghai, SIGGRAPH, Autodesk University, etc. The list goes on and on. He's also made curatorial uh, contributions to various exhibitions of Saha Hadid architects, including the Venice Biennale in 2012 and Saha Hadid Memorial Exhibition in Venice 2016, apart from the shows in Mexico, U uh, UK, USA, and Taiwan. Uh, the, the title of his keynote uh, today would be Cumulative, Collaborative, Disruptive, uh, Architectural Geometry in Research and Practice and its Imminent Mainstream Future. So we are again are very fortunate to have Shei Jie with us today. Uh, and without further ado, please welcome Mr. Shei Jie Bouchard. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, is that working? Yes, perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you for uh, the introduction, uh, Sir Fong, and, and also many thanks for the invitation in the first place to Valai Porn and the organizers of Cadria and, and the, the university and so on. Um, uh, I, I was in Bangkok last year and I was hoping to be there uh, physically this year. Uh, but this this is um, as close to the real thing, and hopefully uh, we get to meet uh, in in person sometime in the near future. So uh, in the meantime, uh, the, the the content of the presentation is more or less uh, as uh, Surapong mentioned. Uh, I just changed the title slightly uh, because our thinking has evolved uh, in the last year uh, quite quite rapidly quite rapidly. So as Surapang mentioned, my name is Shahjay um, and I work currently at Zadid Architects where I co-founded the computational design team code um, and I also teach at the AA uh, <clears throat> and learn at uh, Block Research Group in ETH and previously did uh, some learning at uh, University of Bath. <clears throat> so Myself and my team, like we feel quite fortunate uh, to work in a company, a global company with talent from all over the world. Uh, I think 60 different countries um, uh, in, in spread between Asia to, to Latin America. Uh, we feel fortunate also that, you know, our colleagues and peers uh, and, and seniors uh, preceding generations have uh, are manifesting these uh, amazing buildings, uh, including the, these two that got completed last year, uh, the Beijing Airport and, and the Sohaleza um, Tower with the largest atrium. Um, and, and so we are also uh, fortunate to witness uh, not only the, the the physical manifestation of this, but also like the genesis of, and all the, all the sweat and detailing that goes into, uh, into these buildings. <clears throat> um, and lastly, that allows us as a team uh, 
to focus on uh, a little bit further ahead, uh, the near imminent future, uh, and how we can shape that with new technologies. Uh, so, so we get to play in a serious way uh, because our peers and colleagues are, are uh, really at the bleeding edge of architecture <clears throat> and, and a very enthusiastic and motivated group of people. Um, so we, as a team, kind of tend to research uh, these kind of geometric uh, and uh, so-called comp com computer-aided geometric design technologies, CAGD technologies, uh, and, and its relationship to uh, more mainstream BIM practices. Um, and, and so uh, we've been doing this for the last 15 years or so. And, and now uh, a lot of this is becoming available in a more mainstream way. And we feel very enthused by like these recent developments, both by the block research group on the one hand to bring bleeding edge research to, to uh, make it available to, to a much larger, wider audience. Uh, and also practice-based BIM experience and BIM uh, from Bureau Happold Engineering, they're making uh, it available through these computational frameworks. So very exciting time to be uh, in practice in, in London. <clears throat> um, so that's why like, I, I felt that like we are in a position to talk about uh, the real promise of digital design and robotic construction as, as it is maturing very, very rapidly, uh, which is uh, citizen-centric uh, cities or citizen-centric built environment uh, in, in some ways like for human betterment and effective through effective resource utilization. So, so which I believe is the real promise of digital design and robotic and, and advanced manufacturing. Uh, so the talk will briefly kind of situate like architecture, architectural design and urbanism of such cities, uh, the social and physical technological layers uh, that might need to interact uh, and also a, a first attempt, a first real world attempt that we recently um, uh, uh, try to launch and then hopefully will bring to fruition over the next year. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so uh, finally conclude with like the ideas related to how architecture is like not only physical anymore, it is, it is a kind of cyber physical uh, uh, hybrid entity or kind of augmented reality. Uh, um, so what do we mean by citizen centric cities? Uh, sorry. Um, it is uh, it is from an architect's perspective, not a policymaker, uh, not legal, not financial, uh, and it is a perspective that is uh, informed by a computational design and digitalized construction perspective, uh, and it is also our own history from a parametric and a kind of tectonic uh, perspective. Um, and by by citizen centric cities, we. We had, I mean, it is in the spirit uh, of uh, inquiry and belief that cities make us uh, happier and better um, and, and uh, that uh, cities are entrepreneurial opportunities, they're democratic um, and, and also uh, they're techno optimistic. So those are the kind of qualities uh, that predicate our interest in uh, these, these kind of um, cities. Uh, and participatory cities, like, you know, we, we've been trying to research this uh, at the AADRL where I first studied and now teach for the last uh, 14 years, um, that, uh, you know, we first came to participatory cities through participatory housing. Uh, so, which was the original idea of, like, how you can make uh, housing developments, mixed-use developments, uh, more participatory, more um, resident centric or inhabitant centric. Uh, so now since 2020, since this year, we think we can expand that out uh, to, to uh, small, small scale cities, like 5,000 people or 10,000 people. Um, 
So uh, giving you a broad overview, like the, the, the whole idea, at least for us, kind of started with like around early 2000s uh, by the seminal uh, team and project uh, called RAM TV at the ADRL. Uh, and within which there was like an article uh, published about how communities, residential communities specifically, can uh, self self form and self govern uh, as much as possible. Uh, so it was a kind of uh, use of online technologies. This was pre Facebook uh, uh, ideation and speculation that like you can use uh, web technologies to create uh, online communities uh, and and subsequently use digital construction uh, to produce mass customized um, housing. So and so in since 2015, my, my partner and myself uh, have tried to pick up this thread in, in view of the rapidly maturing uh, digital design and also social technologies and also constructional technologies of robotic manufacturing and, and uh, you know, uh, DFMA or design for manufacturing and assembly and so on. Um, so over the last five years, we have tried to uh, anticipate um, and, and um, you know, through graduate researchers and our own effort and collaborative efforts, uh, we have tried to uh, research this idea across uh, many core topics. Uh, for example, the first uh, one of the main topics um, has been about how to spatially organize communities. Can there be can the communal synergies be physically manifested, particularly in like kind of live work uh, communities, uh, which which were quite common in London uh, b before uh, before the war. Um, so like the ideas of a top shop or a live work uh, ironmongery or uh, a bakery and so on. Uh, so can we can we have something like that? Was one of the topics of. Uh, exploration and then that was for long-term communities and then we also explored similar things but for short-term communities like uh, a lot of uh, you know students uh, and, and young professionals that like come in and leave London at an average tenure of two to three uh, years maximum so how can we address that uh, another topic we like begin to emerge is is the idea of game uh, gamification of, of these uh, how we can leverage uh, game technologies, but also game theoretic mechanisms uh, to arrive at negotiated solutions between sharing and, and resource pooling and so on. Uh, and and uh, across all of these efforts, the main idea is to kind of challenge the 100 year str stranglehold uh, of uh, this architectural diagram of the Maison Domino uh, and it's pairing uh, and it's pairing with a technological equivalent of the NAB patents and reinforced concrete construction uh, and so on. So how we can revisit this in, 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 in the 21st century because it was enormously successful, but also it left quite something uh, to be desired uh, in the effect it had. Uh, so to, to take on the positives while uh, avoiding the negatives, let's say. Uh, so we, we try to revisit across all of these efforts, the idea of a Maison Domino and how we can uh, construct uh, a new tectonism for residential or domestic architecture uh, in, in view with emerging technologies. Um, so since last year uh, with the kind of uh, relative success we had for the last five years, uh, which I will speak about a bit more towards the end uh, of the real world uh, instantiation of some of these ideas. Uh, we now feel that it is time to start thinking about participatory cities. Uh, and that's what we are doing now. Um, just to give you a glimpse of like uh, fresh work from, from the DRL uh, from this year, <clears throat> the idea is to create all, uh, platforms, uh, leverage uh, digital web technologies, but also real-time technologies uh, of interaction um, and pairing virtual and real worlds uh, in some sense through, through a architectural technology layer. And so this, the idea is to kind of have a space of experimentation and, and also speculation and forecasting and predicting of what might be the kind of various 
through gameplay mechanisms or just role role playing um, and, and so on like so we can keep track of motivations and um, so it's it's more a speculative uh, idea to 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 figure out what might happen if you allowed uh, if you revisited urban development from from first principles um, so in that sense uh, we see participatory cities as two composed of two main things uh, two main layers um, uh, so the base physical substrate of industrialized construction uh, and then the social uh, technological layer of governance technologies um, so what do we mean by governance technologies um, you know, when it comes to governance of the built environment, we, we, we all know like it usually relates to taxes and policies of real estate, uh, zoning laws, uh, infrastructure development plans, plan, uh, transport requirements, parking, parking laws, and all of these uh, various laws that are, uh, and governance of those that usually multiply and proliferate quite rapidly. Uh, uh, it is to see can we introduce a technological layer for governance by first principle uh, so which means uh, what is the first principles of governance of all these policies that we have to effectively allocate resource we have to take uh, speedy decisions uh, such that we deliver services uh, to to inhabitants uh, so, and what are the challenges of such such technologies? First of all, it has to be a low risk environment uh, because we cannot make uh, expensive mistakes on, on the built environment. Um, and, and also there needs to be a, a very fluid interchange between experts, uh, oversight like planners, architects, constru constructors, and so on. But at the same time, uh, there are very, very many number of stakeholders like the citizens uh, which uh, <clears throat> were affected uh, by by the, these decisions. So how can these two interact? How can we provide agency to the non-experts who are affected by expert decisions? So those are some of the challenges. And we thought, uh, we think our thinking is that this is where games and game technology uh, uh, and, and their inbuilt mechanisms of user choice, actions, feedback uh, are ideally suited. Um, and and in addition, there's all, all of these game theoretic mechanisms, options, trade-off uh, management, and so on. Um, and so, uh, for example, take this, uh, consider this. And developers have to weigh millions of competing factors. Let's take a dense neighborhood with lots of housing. Without careful planning, that density could have unintended consequences like worse traffic or tall buildings that cast shadows onto public spaces. In other words, good planning requires a holistic understanding of the trade-offs involved. So it's even though, you know, Sidewalks Lab and Google are talking about the right things, trade-offs uh, and, and, uh, and participation, but their, and developers, but their design systems are entirely centralized. They're not participatory, they're not democratic. It's a centralized expert system that go, goes through millions of options and, and then it's executed in one go. Uh, so it is not as uh, transparent as it could be. Um, could contrast that to where we are co uh, coming uh, from is to say that we definitely can leverage and use AI systems, uh, but they are just a non-human player within a game or they can be used to simulate human gameplay uh, forecast scenarios of um, the social layer and the interaction layer. So here we're just simulating uh, 80, 80 players trying to rent and share spaces uh, as they go and, and also share resources and transact between each other um, in a kind of uh, small economy of sorts. Um, so, and then we keep track in this kind of simulated gameplay, like how many transactions happen between who which of the inhabitants um, and the black is a kind of transactions with the community like as a whole uh, and you can see that through every various time instances that changes uh, sometimes the community has to invest more and sometimes it has to invest less uh, so it's a kind of equivalent of a voluntary tax um, so 
and that's uh, that's one side we we think like game technologies are very useful to explore uh, the other is obviously the social layer uh, that are inbuilt to a lot of these game technologies like you can uh, hook it up to a facebook community and try and use facebook for real uh, doing good stuff rather than just while away your time uh, and facebook also has a lot of these ar technologies built in um, and and so it, it, it we could leverage so this is like a kind of simple ar app that we prototype we built where people can like choose various things that they want playground little bedrooms uh, and so on um, so it's a kind of simultaneous game play between multiple people um, uh, and we can also go entirely uh, blue sky with this uh, where we can change we can at least speculate like uh, how to design for all of this choice, like so that it's not just uh, like a car where the choice is related to only the color of your seat or the type of the seat, but we can have spatial choices ranging from, uh, you know, uh, what kind of things people want, like from uh, rock climbing to to gyms, and uh, but <clears throat> at all the time, like to that all of these things can, are physically guaranteed to to be. Uh, viable, um, so it's <clears throat> it's a very highly curated uh, uh, design space with enough variety to uh, offer to various uh, inhabitants. <clears throat> so, um, so that's what we mean by governance technologies, like so to look at self formation, self guided, uh, community forming, cooperative type of. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, um, residential developments and, and so on, and how that can be further extended to cities. Um, by industrialized construction, uh, what we mean, um, first, first and foremost, like the, the kind of technology you use to build cities and buildings uh, definitely affect, uh, has an effect on the, the, the type of city you will get. Uh, so, so they compare Atlanta uh, in the U.S. to Barcelona in uh, in uh, in Spain, and you can also see that it, it has an effect on the ecological footprint. Um, same same population, uh, order of magnitude more uh, environmental impact. Uh, so we're so whilst there is a ready understanding of the benefits of thinking about buildings and cities like cars. And and, uh, and and efficient manufacturing, a kit of parts, and so on. Uh, you know, when this has been tried in in architecture before, uh, this is the Lustrum House. Uh, you know, they leave something to be desired in terms of of, of its mass reproductibility. So we don't want all houses to be exactly uh, without. Uh, so there is a social layer missing in in, in all of this. Uh, which is what we are trying to address. <clears throat> so, so whilst we want to take on the idea, the effect, uh, you know, economies of scale of manufacture and assemble type of industrialized construction, uh, we also want to reconnect and upgrade traditional wisdoms. Uh, why? Because there's a lot of intelligence embedded uh, in, in the way things have evolved in the built environment. Uh, uh, so, for example, we want to reconnect with some of the technologies and thinking. Uh, particularly geometry-based thinking uh, of people like from the uh, 18th and 19th century or even before that from the Gothic and Renaissance times. Uh, uh, these kind of graphical geometric means of designing structure uh, and not only that, uh, all these ge geometry-based manuals of construction uh, so that you didn't need to be a mathematician uh, or a geometer to, to be able to construct these. Um, so all the geometry was the base language through which construction was um, was encoded, uh, and and geometry was encoded in these machines, uh, in these instruments. Uh, it was encoded in the way to draw these um, uh, construction drawings and so on, and even construction instructions. Uh, and so and and so we want to reconnect with those that kind of thinking. So this is also in a way industrialized construction where there's an ecosystem of knowledge workers. Um, I mean, this is pre-computer uh, time, but 
so we 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 see these as very very relevant uh, predecessors to to the kind of effort we want to do. Um, so this is where we see a significant role for architectural geometry, uh, and by architectural geometry we mean structure and construction aware shapes. Um, uh, I will try and give you an ex a few examples of that. Uh, the first one being this effort, a collaborative effort between Block Research Group, our own team at Zaha. Uh, and architecture extrapolated uh, that we, we did in 2018, towards the end of 2018. Uh, so this entire thing was constructed in a pit uh, and all of the material that needed to come to be to make this came through that little door uh, there. So it, um, and so, and this is in the context of, uh, you know, Felix Candela, who uh, was like really one of the early masters of such geometry like structure and construction aware shapes. You can see how thin some of these structures are for the weight they can carry and, and uh, highly perf performative uh, shapes. Um, and, and also it had the additional benefit that they could be constructed using simple straight lines. Uh, so you could create doubly curved geometries with simple ruled uh, or straight line form work. Um, so, uh, in, so that that that's so this is one of the early examples of what we mean by structure and construction aware shapes. Um, but of course, this came at a price because you were making the formwork twice. Uh, basically, you were making the shape twice uh, because you had to get rid of the formwork after it was made. Um, so in that context, we did this one where it is fabric formed uh, and it's lost fabric formwork. So the, the colorful fabric that you see is the formwork uh, for, for uh, laying the concrete uh, on the outside and also it penetrates inside. And it was made, the entire formwork was made in a kind of grandma sewing machine in Zurich, uh, packed up um, and taken on a commercial airplane um, on, on a suitcase. The entire formwork weighs about 55 kilos. It was um, designed and engineered by the Block Research Group um, as part of Mariana's PhD research. Um, then uh, we just made minimum guide work on the side and then we pull, pull, pull up the fabric uh, and ten, tension it. Uh, and then subsequently, you know, architecture extrapolated coordinated all the construction workers. Shaje, may I interrupt, Shajay, interrupt in just a second? A second. Uh, when you talk, you, uh, the video you talk, sound is too loud. Too loud. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. You. Fine. Uh, you mean you. like the sound of the music? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't have any more music in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's a similar. Uh, uh, yeah, so like, so we tried to uh, ex expand on these ideas like previously uh, that everything you see here is somewhat like the shaping of it is related to how it performs structurally uh, and or how to uh, construct it. So for example, all these lines here on the fabric uh, are related to lines of equal tension. So, so there is no wrinkling. So these are not arbitrarily drawn lines. They're drawn specifically to uh, to minimize the amount of wrinkling when you stretch the, the fabric and so on. Uh, so, and also these kind of shapes allowed us to create many little shapes within a small gallery uh, of, of a thousand square meters. Uh, there were 25 different stories that were told in a small, uh, small gallery because of like these kind of added uh, freedom that uh, uh, that curvature and these kind of complex shapes allowed us to to utilize. Uh, so yeah, so this is part of the constructional uh, aspects that you know uh, the the tailor, for example, wanted to uh, uh, stitch it in this way at the bottom right, uh, and then we wanted it to be stitched in the top uh, top right. And so in the end, what was constructed over here. Uh, was some hybrid between 
uh, what we wanted as a design team and what the tailor tailoring team could could achieve. Um, and and the other benefit of this is that uh, the same technology can be used and same thinking can be used whether it is a uh, gallery for mathematics in the heart of London or a uh, school for refugee children. Uh, so this was designed to finish to prototyping uh, an installation within two months. Uh, and so it arrives on site and, and then you just open it up like the umbrella. Um, so, and that's, uh, that's what the, and here's another example of uh, what we mean by architectural geometry or construction and structure aware shapes. So this is related to curved origami. Um, and, and curved origami is very, very simple. Uh, physically speaking, you cut away uh, paper and score paper, and then you fold and you get curvature for free. Uh, and this curvature is obviously structurally beneficial. Uh, and, and it is also beneficial in the range of uh, parametric variations you can create uh, in very, very intuitive ways. Uh, and, and, and also create very complex uh, uh, performative geometries in very simple ways. So all of these, both these two shapes uh, come from a single piece of paper, a uh, single piece of plastic, like with these scores and you can fold and you can also literally scale these things up uh, from small to large. Um, and, and it also has a, a predominant history uh, all the way to Japanese uh, manuals in the 10th century uh, to contemporary art and science. Um, so for example, David Hoffman, uh, Ron Resch in, in, in the 1970s picked this up and tried to uh, make it computer design friendly, uh, look at the mathematics, look at the uh, computer generation of it. Uh, and subsequently it's also been picked up by, uh, studied extensively by Tomohiro Tachi in Tokyo and, and others. Uh, incidentally, this was taught in the, uh, in, in the Bauhaus uh, in the 1920s as part of the curricula for uh, architects. Uh, and so, so we, we, we're trying to pick that up uh, and augment it with some digital tools uh, and, and then allow us to make these kind of curved geometries. This was made in India in 2012 uh, with just a laser cutter. And so you score and you fold by hand uh, and within a few hours you get complex geometry, uh, which is structurally beneficial and it also uh, is materially effective because everything comes from a flat sheet material. Uh, so similar ideas that we did for uh, the, our effort in the Venice Biennale. Uh, so all of the intelligence is ma mainly in this geometric ways of arranging material. So this is six meters tall uh, and, and a millimeter and a half thick aluminum. And so it is self-supporting mostly because of the curvature uh, and also the kind of folded plate action. Um, and, and, and another example, the last one uh, is these benches that we made in, in the Science Museum, um, which again looks at like historic techniques uh, of describing geometry that can be cut for stone cutting as the, the, the discipline of stereotomy. Uh, and, and then trying to revisit that in uh, in the context of robotic hot wire cutting. Uh, so you can go from a full block of foam uh, to the foam work in, in about three, three and a half minutes. So there were 16 different benches all delivered on time, on budget. Um, and so this, the, and it also reflects like the, the, the quality of the finish is, is naturally because of the, the way the foam was cut. And so how it was designed reflects these uh, smooth finishes and so on. Uh, um, so that's, that's uh, more like, that's what we mean by architecture geometry. What are the features it shares with modernism? Uh, of course, it, it, it has a common ground in the sense that it follows the trajectory of teaching, learning and doing. Um, and, and like modernism, like the Maison Domino, it is somewhat aware of the technologies uh, of engineering and fab, uh, construction aware. Um, and, and also there's a new flexible diagram to design with these kind of shapes and for, with these uh, new technologies. And it is also realizable in a spectrum of building economies from India and China to 
uh, to Latin America, uh, where we have done, uh, and also in every place in between. Um, and what is different uh, is that it has far more degrees of freedom. Uh, so as we mentioned before, like this is uh, allows uh, in a very small space to tell very many different spatial stories. Uh, so for example, here we were housing a very somber uh, uh, artifact related to eugenics uh, alongside like more playful ones, uh, all within a small space without having to make special rooms uh, for, for this. So it's a high, high, curvature offers high degrees of freedom to articulate uh, spatial variants and experiences, user experiences. And curvature is beneficial ecologically in the sense that you can use very, very weak material, like in this case by Block Research Group, using just raw earth, uh, uh, very weak material uh, in good structural shape. Uh, so you can span uh, with very weak uh, material, which means very little embedded energy goes into it because for large part of the strength of materials comes from uh, pumping energy into, into the material. So, uh, and this is the principle that uh, they are also now using to produce uh, floor slabs, uh, which are 70% lighter and they save 25% of space, uh, all, all because of like a bit of curvature uh, and also the ribbing on the top. Um, so much so that, um, that recently it, uh, the BBC even picked up like that uh, these ideas of sustainability with pra practic practicable ideas of sustainability and the use of appropriate structural shapes uh, to save material, to save energy, uh, and also have a longevity uh, in, in, in construction. Uh, so uh, that's what we mean by in industrial industrialized construction, of course, uh, factory made manufacture and assembly, but also uh, to reconnect with uh, historic past and, and particularly the wisdoms of the past. Um, so so I will end with like this kind of real world example of where we are trying to bring these two things close to each other. Uh, um, so it's, it's a small island in uh, off of the coast of mainland Honduras. Um, and uh, we are trying to make these kind of uh, housing um, uh, integrated into the landscape. Uh, it's an effort between Zadid architects AKT engineers and Hills and Moran and environmental engineers. Uh, Honduras has a lot of uh, locally certified timber. Um, and so what we are trying to build uh, here is that um, offer choices and allow people to form communities or at least uh, shape their own, um, uh, uh, embed their own choices and like interactions with people. So. So ex we as architects and engineers first lay out these kind of pixel grids uh, according to uh, some global uh, parameters like views and, and solar gain and so on. Uh, and, and subsequently uh, users are able to pick on those uh, 3D pixels uh, and they can choose uh, whether they want to get expansion rights or occupation rights uh, and, and view rights and so on. Uh, and then they can negotiate this with, with their neighbors. Um, and, and subsequently, they can also choose uh, their own internal uh, layouts, whether they want the living room facing the, uh, the, the ocean or they want the, their bedrooms and so on. Um, and, and so just to give a sense of like the amount of choice that designers have to design for, uh, you know, just picking three pixels out of a grid of nine, um, Already you can see how these uh, choices can multiply. Uh, so, so in this first attempt, like we are uh, restricting the choice to a highly curated set, uh, but hopefully in the future, we can expand out uh, to more choice. Uh, the other effort that we are trying to do is uh, to import machines and not like import the entire house. Uh, so we want to import the machines and then use local material uh, and bring the benefits of digital fabrication to, to even uh, uh, low investment, uh, early startup type of communities. Uh, and also uh, synergetically work with the 
quite highly skilled labor that's available, uh, human labor, uh, carpenters, uh, masons, and so on, uh, augment that skill with uh, with like very lightweight machinery, low low capital investment machinery, like like things that can come in a shipping container. Uh, and, and, and so it can build things which are much bigger than the machines together with, with the humans. Um, so, and that also allows us to revisit the supply chain in a way, like how can we turn raw material into the house uh, and where, we, where can we innovate along this chain um, uh, before raw material becomes, becomes a house. Um, so and that's that's like uh, where we are um, uh, to to conclude. Then uh, what we mean by uh, citizen-centric cities is a kind of uh, digitally enabled uh, marketplace uh, interaction between people with in, in investors. Like it could be the state, it could be private investors, it could be some partnership, joint venture. Uh, producers like architects, engineers, uh, contractors, and the eventual consumers, which are like the end buyers or the occupants, the inhabitants, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, we, regardless of who who these uh, main stakeholders are, uh, uh, we believe that like the, the gamified aspect of resource allocation and decision making is an important criteria, so that we don't have to make very many rules like we just set the uh, uh, as as few rules as possible and allow for uh, negotiated uh, solutions to take place so to improve the agency of, of the inhabitants uh, in the decision making in the uh, or to par allow for them to participate in in the decision making process uh, and and all of this is definitely has to be built upon the guarantees offered by industrialized construction so that at least some of the variables are taken out. Uh, so what you see on the configurator or online is relatively close to what you will get uh, in reality. Uh, so that's where we begin to see that there is a cyber physical coupling between our uh, in, in the in, in, of architecture and urbanism in, in the near future. Um, and, and we're all motivated by the same aspects of, of like how we can have uh, effective resource utilization, i.e. sustainability um, and, and social and physical um, sustainability. Uh, and all of these ideas have definitely been at least considered and done before. Um, for example, the Bauhaus, um, in, you know, for the short time that it was active, it had like an outsized impact. Uh, for, so they they even revisit they did definitely look at all the things that we are now looking at, like knitting and weaving and and origami and curved origami and so on, uh, in their workshops, um, in their teaching, uh, and 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 some of this led to like highly impressive um, uh, aspirational showcase buildings. Uh, perhaps, and also a lot of this made its way into the housing of the time, uh, perhaps where modernism did not succeed as much as is in the city scale, like uh, uh, it, it left some, some to be desired. Uh, and that's where we want to succeed, uh, where modernism didn't. Uh, and we, we think the path to su success uh, is to use participatory platforms uh, to solve the problems of the 21st century. Uh, platforms that allow choice and negotiation and also uh, using technologies, design and construction technologies that allow people uh, that connects with the past uh, is upgraded using digital technologies uh, and allows uh, architects uh, to tell stories whilst physically performing well. Uh, so with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, and I thank all the organizers again, for the opportunity to uh, present some of these ideas. Um, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajay, for thank your Rajay presentation. For your presentation. Yeah. And um, it's and, so um, nice to, it's so nice to um, 
um, see the progress see the uh, since progress I have seen your work seen your in work Bangkok, Bangkok last year, Bangkok last and, year. Um, especially and, um, in the especially in the directing of, of Pattery cities, cities and Pattery housing. Sorry, I I can Sorry, hear I, my own voice so echoing. Yeah. I don't know what's wrong. Anyway, um, yeah, um, let's take a question. I, I'm taking over uh, Ben to Rapong because he has to run um, for another meeting. Uh, we have a question from Marie Davidova, one of our session chair. She said, thank you for a very nice talk. I, it gave me new hope in Sahara architects. I am wondering how, you, how do these ideas cope with the Patrick Schumacher's opinion that our public space should be privatized. <laughs> uh, sorry, if I can kind of frame the question, or if I understood the question correctly, how these ideas uh, work with uh, Patrick's ideas related to uh, privatization of public space? Is that the question? Yes. Well, I mean, so first of all, Patrick is a, I mean, he has multiple hats. On the one hand, he's a academic and a, uh, and a theoretician and, uh, and also he's a principal and the majority holder of Zadid Architects and so on. So, <clears throat> uh, and, and the way Patrick posits things is, is, is for discussion and debate. Uh, it's not to be taken as uh, like a dictate, right? And and so how? Uh, so one so part of part of what he says is also provocation. So and and it so in that sense, like we do all of these research work uh, in subsequent or in relation to such provocation. So so that we have considered and uh, and informed. Uh, uh, responses to to the provocation that's one level of how it re relates um, and um, and and the other the way it more fundamentally relates is in the spirit of inquiry is that you know we shouldn't just uh, be averse to something just because person X said it uh, so we, we we want to inquire without having a uh, ideologically predisposed response, uh, and that's that's fundamentally where we we uh, this is aligned in the spirit of inquiry. Uh, so it's it's not uh, yeah. So it's not trying to uh, yeah, like the the pro provocation aspect, or it's not just what it seems like on the surface, right? Like it's. It's not the sound bites. It's not the headlines. I mean, we are definitely being dedicated to this for at least the last 20 years. Um, these ideas of participation and agency uh, of uh, inhabitants, uh, uh, and and also we're not averse to these things taking their own uh, a, a different route. Uh, so this is our take on it. But like we are also open to. Uh, anybody else taking it in a slightly different direction, whether if they think that, you know, public spaces should not be privatized and like, but they can actually make it work like people who have agency. Uh, I mean, we are all for it. And, and actually, you know, my studio is constantly in conversation with uh, other people in the, uh, in other institutions who are taking a slightly different uh, approach to it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's in the spirit of conversation and debate. Uh, uh, and so that all sides of the debate get better. Okay, thank you, Shajay. Um, I hope that um, answer your question, Marie. We have um, two more questions um, from Skylo. May I know if the game system are accessible? Uh, not yet, uh, but uh, there is plans to make it available uh, once we can develop it uh, through to um, uh, through a few more iterations. Uh, just because we want to be right now focused on getting it done, rather than mm -hmm. uh, supporting 
you know, its maintenance uh, online. Like, so similar to Compass and other things, uh, effort by others, uh, uh, you know, Block Research Group and Bureau Apple that I mentioned, uh, that is coming at, towards after five, six, 10 years of like uh, research. Uh, and I think, uh, so we will also see a similar future for uh, this uh, part of the research where we will make, uh, we'll definitely make it available, uh, just not in the immediate future, uh, but perhaps towards uh, summer of 2021. But there's like plenty of others. I mean, a lot of the base technologies are available already through Facebook and through Unreal and so on. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from Hugo Muller, Mulder. Thank you, Shajay, wonderful work and really amazing presentation. My question, how does the Honduras work address changes in, in habitation? So once owners sell their place, can the system be adjusted to the wishes of new owners? Good question. It yeah, hey, Hugo. Uh, I, I assume you're the same Hugo from uh, Arab, or used to be in Arab. Uh, and uh, yeah, no, it, the idea is uh, quite simple that like, yeah, uh, so it, it, it is a kind of digital twin. So once the first owners buy it, they can then sell it uh, or exchange it for other things uh, and and then of course, like, there's only some amount of flexibility when it comes to structural changes, uh, you know, we, uh, but within, within what is possible structurally uh, and also in the mechanical systems, like we, you know, we cannot move toilets around so much. Um, yeah, there is the idea is, is, is for people to transact freely or exchange freely. Uh, so their rights, the view rights or the expansion rights uh, or even occupation rights um, to with as little uh, interference as possible. Uh, and also just the fact that the, there is the expansion right means that people can grow their house. Uh, uh, for example, like some of the users are already talking about, uh, you know, right now they have two children, but then they will go to school and or college and then they don't want so much and so so we are thinking about how that can be then allocated to the community or it can be on a uh, Airbnb system or like a kind of, yeah. So definitely we're considering uh, a uh, expansion system and a contraction system. Um, uh, uh, so, that, so it can grow reasonably from let's say uh, 35 square meter. Each pixel is about 35 square meter to uh, maybe three or four pixels. So the maximum choice we allow is five pixels. Otherwise, uh, the number of co uh, combina combinations that we have to account for is like uh, exponentially grows with every additional pixel that we allow choice for. Okay, I hope that answered um, your question, Mulder. Next, uh, from Christoph Perla, one of our um, session share as well. Hi, Shajay, great work and great to see you here. In some of the work you didn't show today, you often touch on ideas of imprecision from low-tech crafts, um, yeah. such as in your concrete shell pavilion done in India. And that is often by force rather than choice. How has a confrontation with um, inaccuracies by building across the world in the recent decades affected your attitude towards precision and control on site? Yeah, great question. Uh, and hey, uh, Christoph. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like uh, a lot of our collaborators uh, uh, are from, uh, from a time uh, when, you know, digital technologies were nascent. Uh, so, you know, just getting things done was already an achievement. Uh, so precision wasn't uh, as uh, important back then, let's say 10 years ago. And, and, and 
So right now we have over time, we have come to this kind of idea of, I mean, we definitely don't believe in this uh, zero tolerance approach, but, uh, uh, but that there can be greater precision achieved by transmitting the geometric logic of construction. Uh, so, I mean, again, this is not a new idea, but like, you know, like the way the hanging chains were literally the method of uh, drawing stuff on, on, on site, uh, you know, so it wasn't that like it was computed first in a studio and then drawings were made and then measurements were taken on site, like they would just literally hang a chain and and do stuff and, and also how domes are constructed with a guide uh, chain. Um, so, so that and there's a lot of these ideas already in uh in, in 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 new new contracts even like the, the idea of uh, even beam as it should be not the beam way it is 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 predicated on the idea of transference of geometric logic of construction uh so-called method statements and method contracts uh so uh, so that's that's our idea that like if you can describe a method that uh, contractors and uh, uh, others have to follow uh, that that is going to yield greater precision uh, in terms of uh, structural suitability, in terms of constructability. Um, so, and also when we use like, you know, physical forming methods like curve folding, the, the material automatically takes the shape. Uh, like it's similar to hanging chain that by ap applying appropriate force, like you end up uh, with the right kind of shape without having to describe it uh, 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 millimeter by millimeter. You don't have to make too many drawings. Uh, you only have to describe the method. So that's, that's, uh, that's where uh, we see another benefit of architectural geometry is in the realization of complex geometries with simple effective means. Um, and so, whether it is in the Science Museum in London or like a school for refugee children, uh, it's, it's more or less likely to have the same precision. Some of the finishes will obviously be uh, uh, more durable uh, the more you pay for it. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the structural and material economies uh, are not sacrificed because um, the methods methods are uh, transmitted, not not the the frozen shape. Yeah, and mm -hmm. again, it's not a new idea. Like you know, people like Heinz Isler and Gaudi and others did did this a uh, long time ago, and particularly so also in timber. I think like yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Jay. Um, I'm afraid we're running out of time, so um, I would like to thank you again for joining our virtual conference. Actually, we would like to invite you back to Bangkok because. <laughs> It was supposed to be a physical conference, etc. So looking forward to the next time um, you come here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Take care. Uh, I mean, I have time if, if, if there are some questions that need to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But okay. yeah. <laughs> OK, we can save the, the question and send you by email, probably. Yeah. OK, <laughs> thank you. All so right. um, yeah. Bye bye. Um, so um, let me announce uh, quickly the next session will be session four um, by Mark Aurel Schnabel and postgraduate student consortium. So please join the next two parallel session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Bye bye.